So why would any rational person run for Congress? I don't mean any disrespect to the very talented and skilled and rational people running for Congress this year in Delaware or across the country. But if you think about it, it's a really daunting prospect. Who would volunteer to work tirelessly to join this dysfunctional and disrespected body known as the United States Congress? Let's just look at the numbers for a moment. In poll after poll, survey after survey, the current Congress is the most unpopular it's ever been. At 13%, the United States Congress has an approval rating, a popularity, that is lower than cockroaches, <laughs> root canals, colonoscopies, or the Canadian band Nickelback. So we are really scraping the bottom. At 13%, I think the only people who still approve of us are our blood relatives and our paid staff, and I'm not so sure about my staff. <laughs> and if you think about what it means to run for Congress, the cost and the demand and the timing, it, it is remarkable that any rational person would take it on. In the last two election cycles, it cost $1.6 million that you had to raise to run and win for a House seat and $10 million for a Senate seat. So it's a daunting prospect. How did it get this way? How did it get so unpopular and dysfunctional? Well, frankly, there's a couple of reasons. One is that the media has changed. When I was a kid, we all gathered in front of the television to watch Walter Cronkite tell us the way it is. And there were three national television channels, and that sort of focused us in terms of the facts and the news and the issues of the day. And today we have hundreds, if not thousands, of websites that cater to increasingly divided niche political opinions from Daily Coast to Red State and cable TV from MSNBC to Fox that further divides us. In addition to the constant fundraising, the daily lives of folks who serve in Congress has changed. Nearly 40 years ago, when our own home state hero Joe Biden went to Congress, he came home almost every night on the train, something that I do as well, but that really marked him as unusual at the time. Today, because of cheap jet travel and the demands of cable TV and constant fundraising, virtually every member of Congress runs for a train, plane, or automobile right as soon as we're done voting on Thursday and doesn't come back until Monday. And that frays our relationships, means it's harder for us to build ties across the aisle. We've also got gerrymandered districts. In the House, there are fewer and fewer competitive races, and more and more the election is determined in the primary. Very low turnout, very partisan contests. So there's a lot of different reasons why we don't get along as well, why the country we serve is more divided, why the demands are greater than ever, and that then takes me back to my first question. Why would any rational person run for Congress? And I'm here to share with you for a few minutes ways that I, in six years in the Senate, have listened to Delaware, because Delawareans demand that we work across the aisle, that we try and build friendships, and that we try and get things done. And our congressional delegation has done that. One of the very first senators I met was a conservative Republican from Georgia. He was assigned to me as my mentor. His name is Johnny Isaacson. And Johnny has a saying I really like, which is, we don't have to agree on everything. We just have to agree on something. Well, the county of Sussex County, Delaware, grows and raises more broiler chickens than any county in America. And the state of Georgia raises more chickens than any state in the entire state of the United States. And so Johnny and I agreed to form the Chicken Caucus. And <laughs> I got to work with him because I was the chairman of the African Affairs Subcommittee and he was the ranking member, my Republican. And we figured out ways to work together and travel together and break down trade barriers and export more tasty, delicious, and nutritious chicken from the state of Delaware and the state of Georgia. We didn't have to agree on everything. We just had to agree on that one thing. I've also found ways to work with a conservative Republican from Kansas named Jerry Moran. We did some legislating together. We worked on manufacturing, on innovation. We formed a bipartisan competitiveness caucus, and we've done a dozen events together, looking at tax and trade and immigration and intellectual property, things that, given our shared backgrounds and interests in manufacturing and business, was something we could agree on. And last, I'll mention the most senior Republican, Orrin Hatch. I got to meet Senator Hatch very briefly when I was an intern for Joe Biden way back in the 90s, and now I'm his colleague. I didn't know him really at all, but I got to know him through going to our weekly prayer breakfasts that are hosted by our chaplain, by talking to him occasionally at the gym or over lunch, 
And over a long period of time, over a number of years, we realized we had a shared passion for intellectual property. And we wrote the Defend Trade Secrets Act together, which President Obama signed into law earlier this year. So it is possible, even in this most divided and most dysfunctional Congress, even in a Congress where the actions of Senator Ted Cruz three years ago led to shutting down the entire government of the United States. In some ways, we've earned that very low approval rating. But in other ways, if you just listen to and learn from and respect the capabilities and talents of folks on the other side of the aisle, it is possible to get something done. There's also the reason that frankly gets me out of bed every morning and gets me excited every day. And that's helping constituents, helping the people who hired you, helping the people you work for. Let me give you a few quick examples. Doris is a Delawarean who's in her 90s and has been in very frail health, has been in the a critical care ward of hospital a number of times, and she relies on Social Security and Medicare for her health care and her ongoing support. Imagine the distress and the surprise of her daughter and daughter-in-law when they were informed that Social Security had declared her dead <laughs> and cut off her benefits. They called my office in a panic, alarmed, and it took us a couple of days to figure out exactly how to resolve this, but we were able to get Social Security to recognize that Doris was very much alive and to reinstate her benefits that allowed her to get health care. Crystal, a downstate Delawarean who's disabled, um, was cut off by the power company and contacted our office for help, and we were able in a matter of days to get her on a payment plan she could reasonably afford and get her power reinstated in the midst of winter. And last, Cindy is someone who really moved me when I met her early in my time as a senator. She's not just a Wilmington Police Department veteran, she's a veteran of the Iraq War. And when she went over to serve, one of her assignments was to help start, maintain, and, and manage burn pits, these big, vast places where they'd throw all sorts of refuse and leftovers from the Iraqi army and burn them out in the open. Well, this was a terrible idea as a matter of policy because those who were exposed to the fumes developed a terrible condition called constrictive bronchiolitis. And she was trying to find a VA doctor who could treat her, who could diagnose her, and was trying unsuccessfully for several years to get a recognition of her disability. It took us a couple of years, but ultimately we were able to get her access to the right physician, access to the right treatments, and ultimately to get the disability benefits that she earned through her service to our country. Let me tell you one last quick story. Someone who I met in Afghanistan, Mayor Strawbridge, Major Strawbridge, uh, who's from Middletown, Delaware, earned a bronze star for his service. And when he came back, asked if I would award it to him in a ceremony in my office. And I was excited to do that. And then in the run-up to the event, as we got to talking, we realized that we had a chance to do something else special. The member of his family who'd inspired him to come into service in the first place was Major Strawbridge's Uncle Franny. Uncle Franny served in the South Pacific in the Second World War, and like many American veterans, when the war ended, he was so eager to get home, he didn't wait for the bureaucratic paperwork to go through, and he never got his medals from the war. So the entire Strawbridge family came to my office, and I pinned the Bronze Star on Major Strawbridge, and then we surprised Uncle Franny by turning the entire ceremony over to an opportunity to award him the five medals from the South Pacific that he'd earned 70 years before. So a chance to help those who are in need, a chance to help those who've been wronged by a federal agency, a chance to respect and honor those who've served our country. These are some of the amazing reasons why running for Congress, why running for any public office can and should be a rational, even a wise choice. Why do it? To fight for the institutions of democracy that matter and that have to work in order for our country to succeed. To push back against those whose interests are served by dysfunction and failure to move forward in Washington, and last because it's a way to make a real difference for the people we care about, the people of our community. So if you're thinking about running for public office, come on in, the water's fine. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs>